after this we're not talking any numbers because you have so much to bring you're just such a crazy inspiration everybody learned about you in 2022 when you got your big league call up but you've been around for a long time and a lot of people are about to know exactly why by the time that they're done watching and listening to this but this is what i'm going to read off so this was an article titled the greatest rocky that you may never see entering 2022 2000 590 career at bats, 1,109 games for 17 pro teams, 10 full seasons in the minors, six of them in AAA, so literally knocking at the door, five different MLB organizations, four countries, including Mexico, Venezuela, and Australia, each twice, and the Dominican Republic, two independent league team stops. <laughs> I'm losing my breath, dude. Zero, zero date and zero day. <laughs> I can't even finish this. And zero days in the big leagues. And then year 11, boom, you make it to the big leagues, 31 years old with the Rockies. And then literally everybody knew about you if you followed baseball. If you didn't, I'm going to play this clip right now. Mom, I'm going to the major leagues. <laughs> I'm going, mama. I'm going, mom. I promise. I promise, mom. I'm going. Come on. I got to figure out all the logistics in a second. They just told me just now. I did it, mommy. I did it, mom. I love you so much. Thank you for everything, mom. Thank you. Thank you for. Thank you for supporting me. I can't do this without you. You just fulfilled your destiny, son. And I love you. I'm gonna call you back. I, I, I'm gonna talk to my manager and everybody, and we're gonna figure it out. I'm just, I'm just so overwhelmed. <laughs> Sorry, what is mom? Well, you worked hard. You deserve it. You deserved it. Mom, you don't know. You don't know how many times I would think about <laughs> you taking care of dad. <laughs> and it would keep me going. Because I'm like, if she could go through all of that, if she could go through all of that, then I can do this. I can, I can do it. And you give me, you give me a lot of inspiration, mom. And I promise I'm gonna keep working just as hard. When, when I'm up there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be working just as hard. Like I said, you fulfilled your destiny. Even if you only go up and stay there for one day, you made it. Absolutely. You made it to the mountain top. All right, so that was your call-up clip. But dude, that's crazy. When you hear that laundry list, I know you've said it before in a bunch of different podcasts, but like, what does it sound like all to you right now still when you hear that? Man, it's just like literally just playing around the world and all the experiences. It's hard to just describe. I've just been every single, every single destination, every single stop. And it was never the big leagues until, you know, August 12th. But it was just like everything came full circle. But kind of like you said, just literally all over the place. I mean, I'm, I'm in Venezuela with nothing to eat, you know, with my roommate, Carlos Moncrief, like, man, what are we going to eat tonight to going down to Mexico? Just worrying about, I, I remember they caught El Chapo and we we're worried about playing in a game the next, the next day and the whole city is in chaos. And I'm like, but it, it, it was all worth it. You know, it's just like all these experiences led to me where I wanted to be. And eventually I knew I was going to get there. I just had to fight for it. Dude, yeah, you definitely got there. And like I said, everybody knew. And uh, guys, if you didn't know, you're definitely going to learn a little bit tonight. But that's nuts that you have to like think about those types of things, too, because it wasn't always the best situations. Because like you said, if you're in a different country and you're worrying about like El Chapo, well, in the United States, if you're playing, I don't know, uh, down in Tampa, you're like by the water, you're chilling, hanging out. But you, you literally never had it easy, which is crazy, because even as a kid, you didn't have it easy. You're on a, a, a baseball team in Little League. You made the all-star team, and this was kind of like your first taste of adversity where you didn't even start the all-star team because the coach's kid was playing and he played the same position as you did, so he got the start. Welcome to to the world of, uh, shoot, what was to come for the next like 30 years of your life. <laughs> I know, right? You know your research. That definitely happened. I, uh, <laughs> I, was, ter I was terrible when I was 10, but you know, my 11-year-old year was when I first, I think it hit me that you know, there was a lot of politics and everything. And I led the the whole little league in batting average. It was six oh nine. I'll never forget that number. And uh, I remember my baseball coach right wrote it on my, you know, team baseball at the end of the year. He's like, "Man, you hit six oh nine this year." He's like, "You led the league by hundred points." 
and I made the all-star team. I was so excited. I was like, never did I imagine because a couple of years ago, like I said, I was terrible. And then I was looking to go to all-star team, like, man, I'm going to be playing every single day. This is going to be awesome. And I didn't get to play one game in all-stars. And like you said, the coach's son, he got to play every single game. And I was like, is this really how it's going to be, man? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what that kid ended up doing. I don't know either. We we might yeah. need to find out. We we got Google. <laughs> <laughs> After your playing days, when we do a documentary, we'll go track him down, right. him and his dad. I know. And speaking of parents too, dude, your dad was a naval officer. Obviously not growing up in the most ideal situations they did, but uh, dude, they seemed like they were the best parents in the world. Oh my gosh. I had such a good upbringing. I'm truly blessed. My mom is actually an uh, educator, so she was a teacher. And a superintendent right now, right? Yeah, superintendent. Or she, She's retired now, but she was a superintendent. And like you said, my dad was in the Navy, and eventually he worked for CBS back home as like an engineer. And he would work the night shift, and then my mom would work during the day. And their whole goal just in life was just to provide for their kids. Like, my dad grew up poor, my mom grew up poor, and they just wanted us to have the experiences that they never had. And I absolutely love that because... All the stuff I've done, they never got to do, like play sports across the world. They never got to do that. They never got to travel, you know, when they were growing up. Um, piano lessons, saxophone lessons, anything we wanted. Tutors, they never had any of those luxuries. You know, my mom had a, a scholarship offer for Michigan State, and her father told her, I can't pay for it. You know, it's like all, this, all the things that they never got to do, they were like, well, we're going to make sure our kids have at least the chance to, to do it. And that's like, a, that's just the biggest blessing, I think. I mean, even just the other day, I saw on your IG story, I saw three different jerseys, a football jersey, a baseball jersey, and a basketball jersey. And I was like, dude, Winton is making the rounds this offseason. He's going to any and every game possible. But it was each of your brothers, Walter and Wayne. One played basketball overseas, and the other played in the NFL. And, and dude, you guys had Bo Jackson posters on the wall growing up as a kid. It was, it was like the perfect culmination of, of, of the three of you. It's like the you guys had your own big three in your family growing up. No, for sure. They're just such big, great influences and uh, good brothers to look up to. Like, I wanted to play basketball because of Wayne, and then I wanted to play football because of Walter. And then I was like, you know what? Let me create my own thing through baseball. But just watching them and how they went about sports growing up, they're about biggest role models. Everything they did, I wanted to do. And so, I mean, even to this day, it's like I'll go back and watch Wayne's clips from – from Davidson, you know, he's scoring 28 points on Duke. I'm like, how did he do that? You know, Coach <laughs> K after the game was like, Wayne Bernard was the best player on the floor that night. That type of stuff inspires me. I go back and watch, I was playing in Albuquerque all year, uh, besides Colorado, and I'm going back and watching all of my brother's games at University of New Mexico in football. Like, I was so inspired by him and his teammates. It was just like, man, these guys are the biggest deal in the world. And I think all the positivity from them that I saw – and all the drive and hard work, it was just like the perfect, it was the perfect influences for me at the time. We have a nine-year age gap and a 12-year age gap, and I couldn't ask for anything better. Yeah, it's so wild when you think about it, because obviously you can't determine when you're born or, 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 or any of that stuff, but just like that age gap and the fact that your parents just took care of you guys so much, and, and it's like what both of them did, uh, your father at the time and your mother, and still to this day, your mom, just you could just see that trickle-down effect. You know, like you are one of the most caring people that you could possibly meet. I'm sure your brothers are the same exact way. I haven't gotten the chance to meet them just yet, but it, it really shows through you. And again, just your character is just absolutely tremendous. And it started at such a young age through your parents. And like you just said, your brother's growing up with them. No, for sure. I appreciate that too. It's just like, I think my parents always set the example of it doesn't matter who you are or what you do, as long as you respect people. And I learned that through them and kind of like the same concept about caring about people. It's like, I care about people's feelings and how they, how they feel. And so I just take that into everything I do. It's like, you almost want to think about the other person first and you don't have to think about yourself all the time. And my brother showed me that love. So then I show that back to everybody else. And my parents show me that love. I try to show that back to everybody else too, because we only get one life. And we can't take everything with us. So I, I really take that to heart. I'm like, you got you to gotta show the love to everybody. Yep. And like we said before, whether it was Little League or even when you were at the high school level, like life's not all about sunshines and rainbows. And you're playing uh, baseball in high school. And tell everybody, because you're going to tell better than I would, but what your coach said to you when you told him that one of your goals was to get a scholarship 
for in, in college baseball after you're done playing your high school days? Yeah, so I I was really upset because as a junior in high school, you obviously want to be on varsity, you know. And when you think about Michael Jordan, like he was cut from his varsity team, he was a junior. Um, it's Fred kind of McGriff. embarrassing. Yeah, exactly. There's a, you know. So my high school, I was like, you know what? Since I can't play varsity baseball, let me just go out for track. Like, I want to get a scholarship. I want to play D1. I want it to be a baseball, but I want to get, you know, in the college somewhere. So I go up to the track coach. I was like, hey, Coach Jones, you think I can go out for track today? He's like, well, you know, what is, what is a co baseball coach going to say? And I said, well, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm not on varsity anyway. Let me just, let me see what I got. So I call my mom, like, Mom. I want to go out for, for varsity track today. Can you, you allow it? He's like, yeah, go ahead. My dad was like, same thing. I'll be, th I'll be there. I'll come watch you. So that same day I hadn't gone to any practices or anything. I didn't have any cleats. I asked one of my friends, I was like, Hey, can I use your cleats for this next race? And he's like, sure. A little bit small, but I, I still warm. I ran the hundred and I got first place. I did the high jump. I got first place and I did the long jump and I got first place. I, I got first wow. place in three events. My first time doing track. And the next day is when my coach in high school found out about it. So he brings me to the office, starts cursing me out. You know, what the F do you think you're doing going off for track? I was like, I really just want to play, you know, baseball in college. And I want to get a division one scholarship. And he's like, division one scholarship. He's like, you can't even start for me here. Why do you think you can get a division one scholarship? And I, man, I was, I was so devastated. I, you know, I told my mom about it. I told my dad. And they were so frustrated, too, and they wanted to do something. But I just said, no, it's, it's better than not. Let me just let me just keep grinding, and I'm just going to keep improving, keep getting better. And I remember the next day I had a game against La Costa Canyon, and I hit two home runs in one game. It was in JV. And it was almost like it was undeniable. All the parents were talking about it. Like, you know, Winton's hitting 450. Um, he's hitting all these home runs, these RBIs. Like, we got to call him up to varsity. And so that, that next day on a Friday, I finally got called up to varsity after like 25 games or whatever, or 20 games on JV. But I'll never forget him telling me, you know, you, you can't even start for me here. Why do you think you'll be able to get, get a Division One scholarship? Oh, man. It's crazy, too, because it's like all these coaches, you always hear they always can either make or break you. And it's just like, why are you not lifting – your 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 kids up why are you not encouraging them talk to micah johnson he played in the big leagues for a little bit now he's one of the most well-known nft artists right now uh he's one of his characters aku is on the cover of times he said he was like dude i it all takes is one person to give you that vote of confidence even if you're bad at something um and then also too it's like you have these coaches that say negative things about you there's uh one of my buddies dave stevens who's born without legs he eventually played independent league pro ball for a couple of weeks with Daryl Strawberry, having no legs. He didn't let anything stop him. And in high school, he said that he was playing a game and he, uh, the coach on the other team was just talking smack the entire at bat. And he just, during his at bat, he ended up hitting an extra base hit. And he said, as he was rounding the bases, again, keep in mind, no legs. He's saying stuff back to the other coach. When he got back to the dugout, his coach pulled him aside and said, don't, don't ever do that. Don't ever be like that guy. And he like yelled at him. He got in trouble. He got reamed out. And it was because don't basically pretty much don't let an asshole turn you into an asshole. And this was in high school and that stuck out with him forever. So what you're saying right here, these are things that stick with you forever and just adds fuel to the fire and just that extra motivation. And it's always going to treat you or at least your mindset as like kind of like a, like a cup of ca a cup of coffee, that natural boost of caffeine where in those moments where you're down, you're always going to go into your back pocket and just think about that coach that said that to you, which is, yeah. Oh, man. Sorry. Exactly. It's good. This gets me fired up just thinking about it. <laughs> I know. No, back to your point, just like, what, what's the point? And I, I know that 50 cent line in, uh, in, it's in Hustler's Ambition. He's like, I need you to hate. I need you to hate so I can use your, you know, fuel for energy or something like that. Like, it's like, <laughs> yeah. that, like I need you to hate. So then I, I, I kind of took that approach. Like, you know what? Let me use this as more motivation to get me to where I want to be instead of a lot of kids will take that and they'll be like, you know what? Oh, my gosh. Coach is right. Like, I can never make it anywhere. And I think that's what hurts a lot of kids is like they hear that stuff, especially at that age. And then their motivation is just diminished. They're like, 
he's he's supposed to be my biggest advocate and he's sitting here telling me I can't make it. So I had two choices. I could have listened to him and he was, you know, one of the most well-known coaches in San Diego, or I could have said, you know, I'm going to prove this guy wrong and prove myself right. So I chose the latter. Dude, yes, sir. And then you did end up going to college and playing baseball at Niagara. <laughs> right. Yeah, that was like that was a, that was a huge step in your career, and I know you're thinking about uh, possibly going to play at, at USC in Oregon, but it was uh, Niagara, and that's one of the questions that it seems like everybody always asks you: How this dude from San Diego end up in Niagara? But it, you go where there's opportunity. That's exactly right. You had an opportunity there, and and you jumped on it. Yeah, I had to. I was pretty late into my uh, senior year, and USC was offering me no money. Oregon was offering me no money. They just had, you know, walk-on spots. And my parents asked me, they're like, well, if you really want to do it, you know, we can make a sacrifice. We're just going to have to pull out a ton of loans. And I was like, you know what? If Niagara's calling and they want me, go where you're wanted. And so I was like, I can make a name for myself. Hopefully at Niagara, I'll be able to learn new new experiences. You know, maybe at USC or Oregon, I might not be able to start till my junior year. Or who's to know um, if I don't get enough money, if my parents can afford it at least go where I was wanted. And so I ended up going out there, yeah, my freshman year. And I didn't sign until, I mean, school started like in three weeks and I signed. It was crazy. Dude, yeah, I'm sure the adrenaline and the nerves are probably kicking in big time at that point because it's such a small window of time. And and next thing you know, it's not only just like you're going off to college, you're going off to somewhere where the weather's completely different. It's, It's a different time zone. And then you get out there and you're playing baseball and you're working at the dining hall and this is one of the things that I love about you most is is that the money that you made, you sent back to your parents just because you were so fortunate for, for just them sending you to college and for them always being there for you. Not, like usually if, if you're a freshman in college, you're taking that money and you're going to the bar, which everyone has a dollar beers that night. But dude, yeah, that that was so awesome. And, and I'm sure even in the dining hall, you learned a lot of lessons too. Oh, I definitely did. It was pretty cool because – I think a lot of times in my life, like people have, you know, well, with anybody, you get made fun of. It's just kind of how you react to it. So I remember even working at the dining hall my freshman year, guys on the team were giving me a hard time or, you know, people are on class and they're like, why are you working at the dining hall? Like it was so frowned upon. Uh, You know, I had a little cap on. I'm sitting here waiting tables like the bus boy. But I didn't care. I was like, I'm doing this for a purpose. Everybody Everybody else was going out drinking and you know, messing around with girls and smoking and doing all the, the things I don't want to get into. And here I was, you know, having playing D1 baseball, getting good grades. Um, and I was working at the dining hall just to sacrifice the money so my parents could, could see me during the season. And I'll never forget, I wrote them a letter when they came to see me. And it was in a card and it was all cash. And so, I don't know, it might have been $1,500 for, for the couple months that I had worked so far. And my dad opened it and he just started crying. And I, you know, I wrote in the letter, I was like, you know, exactly what I said. I said, I could have been out there partying and doing all this stuff, but I've been working on the side. They had no idea I was working. They had no, absolutely no idea. And I said, I've been working so that you can come to see me more times than one. And this is going to pay for your, you know, your trips. And they were just so, they were just so thankful. Like, and that made me feel so good. And to this day, that makes me feel really good just to know that, how happy they were that I would do something like that for them. But it's like, there's no way I can pay my parents back for all the stuff that they've done for me. Like I just try, you know what I mean? I I try to do it, but there's no way they've done so much for me. That story is amazing. And thank you for sharing. I I think I heard one of those, like at at a similar time that you had shared uh, along the same lines, it might've been that same exact one. I remember like getting like all teary as I was hearing it. And just now I'm like, damn, is, is someone cutting onions in here? Because as, <laughs> <laughs> as, as the, as first off, like as the parents, I'm sure your dad was bawling for so long. Like you said, dude, again, not everybody's doing that. And I, I got to ask you too, because, because you said that like teammates and everybody like looking uh, frowned upon, but kind of like, what was, what was your mindset behind that? Because I think right now, especially in this day and age when there's social media around, everything is just like the highlights of people's life, right? And if you want to be a baseball player, well, that baseball player is probably not going to want to see, be seen scooping ice cream, you know? But it's like, yo, you need to make that $10 an hour so that you can <laughs> have some sort of money, like share that type of stuff. But then like people just don't want to go into some of these roles because they're afraid of what other people are going to say. So for you having been in it and being on both ends, what would you say to them? 
I would say, I mean, it sounds cliche, but I literally say you, you don't really care what other people think. And if you take that attitude, you'll find out that a lot of people will envy you or are jealous and they have their own self-esteem issues and they try to portray it on you because they sometimes want to be you or they want to be in your situation. You know, I look at some of my teammates who are making fun of me. Maybe they were jealous that I was making some extra money on the side. You know, they didn't think that they could handle, you know, playing a sport, doing well at a sport, getting good grades and, you know, managing work. And instead they're out there partying. So it makes themselves look bad. So on a face value, everybody's like making fun of me, but in the end I'm, I'm winning because I'm getting more ahead than they are. I'm making my parents happy. I'm doing what I think is, you know, the right thing. And so if you don't care what people think, a lot of the times you come out ahead. Yep. And another thing that I want to add to that too, because you mentioned this earlier about your high school coach, I kind of just like you need that some hate and you need some other stuff. A, a good way to kind of think about it is that like, all right, if this, if this person, if this teammate is jealous or giving me hate because I'm cleaning the cafeteria, well, if that's as bad as it's going to be, all right, cool. If, if you have this coach who is telling me that I'm not going to get a college scholarship, well, all right, if that's as bad as it's going to be, that's cool. I could deal with that. You can deal with these certain things. And these are all like things that are just like, all right, well, at least it's not like uh, something even more intense that you can't handle or you can't control, you know? So it's almost like, all right, well, if that's, if that's what it is, all right, cool. Sounds good. Next. Exactly. Exactly. That's how I just approached it. Like er everything you just said, it's just like, okay, whatever. You know, you just have to brush it off. Dude, yes. Oh, man, I'm fired up. <laughs> Dude, this, I, I'm sure everybody at home is so pumped and we haven't even gotten to like the, the peak of all this just yet. But so you're taking a, 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 a final at Niagara. You're taking a, a, it was an accounting final and you got a phone call. Oh, man. Um, again, everything that I've heard about your father, he seemed like he was an amazing man. Everything that you talked about him, um, it, it's he clearly had an impact on you and I could see so much of him from what I've read and from what I know about him and from how much I know you that he just shines right through you. But this, uh, this one time during your freshman, freshman year was, uh, was, it was a, a life changing phone call that you got. Yeah, it was tough. And I appreciate the words again, man. Cause you know, when I was a kid, my, my father was everything like aside from my brothers and my mom, it was like, I wanted to be my dad. Anything he did, I wanted to do he retired when I was in sixth grade so we got to spend every single moment together you know growing up he would make me breakfast in high school he made me breakfast every morning and I'm not just talking like a bowl of cereal he would get up and make me a full breakfast every morning no questions asked he would pick me up from school I mean we, we were just like you know best friends I hate to say it as a parent but we, we really were like he, we were just always around each other. He was my, my role model, like everything. And so, uh, you know, back to freshman year, when I got that call, I was taking my accounting final and my brother Walter called me and he was just like, you know, dad had a stroke. You, you need to come home immediately. And I was on the next flight out, you know, of Buffalo. And I told my accounting teacher, she said, you know, take care of business, go home. And I think from that point on, my, my whole life just kind of changed. I remember showing up to the hospital the next day and my dad couldn't recognize me. And so you go from, you know, talking all the time and having all these relationships. And then the person that you love so much can't even, you know, say your name or recognize you. And that lasted for a couple, couple of weeks. And so emotionally, I was, you know, 18 years old. Emotionally, I was really, really hard to handle yeah, and and you're away for all of it too. I mean, obviously you got home, you got that flight back, but it's just like even that, uh, just having to wait for a plane, having to wait for the plane to to take off and fly back home, and and like you said, like he was the type of dad who would make you a full breakfast. He was over there, and and I swear, like every day when I wake up now, uh, being a father of my own, I'm like, I want to try to make the most of every single day. Like, what can we do today? How can how can we all have fun? How can we all get better? And like, he seemed like he was, he was that like, like a, like a Superman almost, you know, and uh, just always there for you. And I know exactly what you mean too, when it's just like the best friend type dynamic where it's just like, 
dude, he's your he's your boy, you know, mm -hmm. um, as much as he's your dad. He's he's always there. Right. For you. So, yeah. So you got that opportunity to go home and you got to see your family more. You were uh, at a at, what was it? Riverside. Riverside Community, Community College. College. Right? right. That's right. All right. So so you made the adjustment right there. You left Niagara. So that was nice that you guys got to be close in proximity at that time. Again, kind of going back to what we were talking about before, things you can control and can't control. This was something you were able to control. So you made it better. Right. And, you know, kudos to Coach McCoy at, at Niagara because he was like, you know what? He was pushing for me to go home. He says, go home, see about your father. We can worry about, you know, everything else later. And so that year was kind of a blessing because the doctor said they didn't think he was going to get as far as he did. Um, he was never able to walk, but my mom was able to take care of him. And he got to see some of my games my sophomore year. So she would care for him day in and day out. You know, she's doing every single thing. Like she was basically a full-time nurse and she would drive up to Riverside and take him out of the wheelchair so we could, you know, see some of my games. And there's one special home run I hit. I think it was like my third home run of the season. And, you know, my dad couldn't stay out there the whole game, but he would come out for my bad and then maybe go back in or sometimes he was too tired, but I knew he was in the car. But this specific one, he saw me hit it. And I remember crying around the bases and looking at him um, just because at that point, you know, like I said, the doctors didn't think he would able be able to progress any further. Like it was almost like he's not going to make it. And so I was so happy at that moment. He, you know, he got to see one of my home runs and then following that sophomore year, uh, I was trying to transfer, you know, closer to home or go back to Niagara. Um, but I wanted to go to San Diego state. And so the San Diego state coaches, Tony Gwynn and coach Martinez were like, if you take one more class, we can get you in through rolling admissions. Let's see how you do up in summer ball in Bellingham, Washington, and we'll go from there. So I'm taking a class, and I go up to Bellingham, Washington, and playing summer ball. And the last conversation I had with my dad was, Dad, I'm going up to Bellingham. Um, I'm going to try to transfer back to San Diego State. Basically, just like hang tight, and I'll be, I'll be home. I'm doing this for you because I didn't want to go all the way back to Niagara to, at this point. I wanted to stay closer to home. And so that conversation, he was in the hospital, but he was doing better. I thought he'd be out, you know, in a couple of days. And as soon as I told him, you know, I'm leaving to Bellingham, he started crying. And that was the last conversation I had with my dad. That's what, that's what made baseball so hard for a long time because I always felt like if I hadn't left, I would have got to spend more time with him and I would have got – you know, a, a quote unquote, a goodbye, but I never felt like I got that true goodbye because my last one was like, dad, I'm leaving. And he started crying. So that was my last interaction with him. And, um, I was in Bellingham. I asked my brother, how's dad doing? Everything was fine. And one day he would just called me. He's like, Hey, you need to get home now. So I start, I start driving home. I make it to Sacramento. He's like, you need to get home right now. And I, get a flight in Sacramento. I leave my car at a friend's house, get to San Diego. My brother picks me up. We're rushing to the hospital and we miss him by 30 minutes. And just that moment, um, you know, I'm, I'm just in total shock. Like I was screaming, hitting the floor. I didn't know what to do. I was just freaking out. And I'll never forget my brother Wayne just holding me. He says, I got you little brother. Like you don't have to worry about anything. And, uh, it, it, it was it was a moment you know I'll never forget and sometimes you know I try not to think about it too much but it's it is important because I know how much support my brothers have and for him to tell me like in that moment like I got you no matter what that was a lot of strength on his side and uh, I felt a lot of comfort with those words and so um, in that instance baseball was pretty hard because I always felt like man if I didn't uh, if I ha if I wasn't playing or if I didn't have to go all the way to Bellingham, I would have been there for my dad. And going back to Niagara my junior year was really, really tough, you know, leaving my mom. I didn't get into San Diego State. They couldn't get me in through rolling admission. So then I wasn't there for her again. So it was, it, was, it was a really, really, really tough, probably the toughest thing I've ever been through. And I'll never forget Coach McCoy says, like, I'll never – or God won't give you something you can never handle. And he wasn't, like – you know, minimizing or diminishing like my dad's death or anything. He was just saying like, you can handle this and you'll, you'll be able to get through it. You have the right support system. And I really thank him for that. 
first off, th- thank you so much for sharing that. Cause like you said, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's gotta be hard to relive some of those moments and, um, just like you try to forget about it, but also like it's, it's, it's what, man, it's just kind of hard to talk about it. Uh, it's, it's kind of what molded you into who you are today. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you said, the support system that you had, your brothers being there for your, your, your mom having taken care of your dad the entire time. And it's like the last time that your father saw you play baseball and you hit that home run, it was, it's a powerful moment. You know, that's such a powerful moment. There's always going to be that connection that you guys have on the baseball field. And it's, it's almost like he's, he's with you there no matter what, you know, he may Mm -hmm. not be there physically, but he's always with you. Um, and, and and just again, just everything that you just shared, I I, I respect, I appreciate, I thank you. Um, your your humility and your humbleness is is off the charts, just as much as your character is. So I thank you, man. again, seriously, thank you. That is, and and I think you talking about it, just somebody listening to this will allow them or help them with what they're going through, or maybe talk about what they have experienced too, because there's. Not everybody who talks about this type of stuff. So just mm-hmm. by you sharing this, I'm sure is helping somebody out there, which when you got called up to the big leagues and the video went viral of you FaceTiming your mom, that's a great, that's a great story. That's a great moment. Um, but again, like I said at the beginning of this, as as I dig deeper, as I learn more about you and, and do more and more research, I'm like, man, this dude's got such a better story than what the world knows. And like, it's that video is just kind of scratching the surface. So like everybody right. listening to this and watching this right now, like the same dude who made his MLB debut at 31 years old is the <laughs> same person who went through all of this adversity and you were still in college. You weren't even 21 just yet. Right. Right. Exactly. No, you're right. Yeah. So like when you think about it, you had a world of, of, of experiences that sometimes people experience in 80 years. Mm-hmm. And it was almost just kind of, again, just all, all part of your journey, all part of your story of, of just becoming the man of who you are today. And uh, you, you had the, sh- dude, you had the strength to go back to Niagara, your junior year. And you've said this before in an article written in the athletic that you felt lost when you went back to junior year and you made one phone call to somebody that, uh, <laughs> that was in, San Diego at the time, and I believe still is, but coach, yeah, he kind of stepped into, would you say kind of like a fatherly type role? Absolutely. And this was something completely on a whim. So guys, if, 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 if you're a need or if you're looking for help or if you want to make one phone call, one email, a text message, it could possibly change your life and, and it could help you big time the same way that it helped Winton. <laughs> No, so true. I think my philosophy for some reason my whole life has kind of been like, you never know, right? And one of my brothers, he messaged me and said, hey, there's this guy in San Diego. I know you've been struggling with hitting, but hit him up. He does the radio. He knows a lot about baseball. Just like, just call him or send him an email or do something. So I sent this long email. His name is Coach John Cantera. I'm like, hi, I'm Winston Bernard. I go to Niagara University. I just hit 230 my junior year. And I told him about my father passing, but I was like, I, I know you know a lot about baseball. Is there any way you can help me? And he says, he sends a re- response in like three hours. He goes, meet me at Torrey Pines High School tomorrow and we'll get to work. And I was like, all right, well, let's, let's, see, let's see how this goes. Well, shit, and so, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, in Niagara, <laughs> um, and back to Niagara, my junior year, I asked the coaches to try to find me something closer to home. I want to be next to my mom for the summer, right? They want you to play college summer ball. I'm not trying to go to virginia to play summer ball and so the coach said he sent something out to all the california collegiate teams and this is one of the assistant coaches apparently he did it and so i took it on myself to email every single team in the california collegiate league and they're like oh we never heard about you i was like well the niagara <laughs> one of the niagara assistant coaches said he did everything but he didn't so they said well we i have some room on our roster just hang tight and i kept emailing all I was like coach wicks I was like, please, I'm hungry for this. I need to get back into what I love. He's like, someone just dropped off our roster. You can come. So I work with Coach Contera on a Friday, and we he just t- teaches me some things in my stance. I was, like, super open. He's like, close that stance off. Get the shoulder in a little bit. He's like, you're using your shoulders too much. Use your hands. And we started hitting. And then in my first game in the California League, 
California Collegiate League game, I go two for four. And then we work the next day, and I, I go two for four again. And I'm like, I'm commuting all the way up to OC just to play California ba- or college baseball and going all the way back home. So it's like a two-hour drive there, two-hour drive back, and I would work with Coach Quintero before the game. So I'm getting all this hitting in, driving up, driving back. We had games in Santa Barbara. I'm doing this whole thing in California all summer. I ended up hitting – uh, 375 in the summer league. So I was number two, and I was like top five in every single major league category. I'm talking to coach. I'm just like, man, who is this guy? And not only did he help me out with baseball, but he was just helping me out with life. He was like, he kind of stepped in as a father figure just at the right time. I just lost my dad a year before that. And here's this guy who doesn't know me from Adam, and he's treating me just like his son. He's giving me life advice. You know, anything you need, just let me know. I'm calling him about different things. And I mean, not to bring race into it, but I am. I mean, he's he's a white man, and he's got this this black kid. It's just like the coolest thing ever. It's like he didn't he didn't care as as I didn't care, you know. And you don't see that all the time. I think that's what makes it so unique. And so he's been you know such a good role model for me. And like I said, I think God put him in my life at such a crucial time because without him during that time, maybe I don't go to summer ball and have the season I did to put me back on track for my senior year at Niagara. Yeah, and it came in, like you said, at the right time, which is wild because you can't plan any of that stuff. And, yeah, had not had you not reached out to him, who knows what would have happened after that. So that's mm-hmm. why it's just so important to just do that, that just one thing again, like just reach out to anybody. And was it that summer, too? Didn't you win, like, the uh, a gold glove and, and the MVP of that league also? Yeah, that was it. Dude, tell a friend to tell a friend. Let's go, baby. <laughs> Bumble, you weren't going to bring that up. I had to. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for doing it for me <laughs> that's what i'm here for baby hype man let's go <laughs> um, but uh but after that so it's the 2013 draft you are at a workout your hand's killing you carlos correa is there uh max freed was there whatever they ended up going one and seven overall in that draft and uh, again just like another wall that you had to knock down your hand's killing you and you're there and then you ended up being drafted in the 35th round of, of the 2013 MLB draft. And I don't even think that round is around these days. And there's a lot of my guys who have been on this show who they've gotten drafted in the later slots and that doesn't matter. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter. It's all about the drive of the person, the, the work ethic, the character, everything that you have. And like we said before, nothing has been sunshine and rainbows. And what was it? Uh, you're at a tryout too, where there's, was this, a, this might've been actually after your first year, right? So you, Got yeah. drafted, and then was it 2014? You went to the Tigers open tryout. Yep, that was it. Yes, yeah. so you went to an open tryout, 120 some people there, and only one of them got signed, and it was you. Right. And a dude by the name of Benny Castillo, who do you still keep in touch with today or no? Yeah, I just uh, was texting with him like a couple weeks ago. All right, there you go. He knew you had something special. <laughs> but so it's like it's it's just so crazy because it's like nothing is ever handed to you. And, and, and it just seems like you're always placed in these positions to battle your way out. And just like, were you always thriving on that type of stuff? And like, did all these things as they come along just seem so minute in the grand scheme of things, because you're used to that type of stuff. You're used to the adversity. I think it's just built me. It's, it's I'm not going to say it's I'm used to it. It's just like, it, it's just built who I am. Um, I just try to accomplish everything I can. I'm not going to say it doesn't stress me out or anything, but Adversity is tough, you know. I back to my senior year at Niagara. I broke my hammock bone with three games in the season, and the week before that, all the scouts had just texted me. There's like four or five different scouts. They saw me play against University of Buffalo, and I had a good game against Tom Murphy. He was the catcher, and I stole a couple bases off him. They're like, "Who's this kid from Niagara?" And then my hammock bone breaks. So then Coach McCoy at Niagara's like, "Hey man, you have to tell all the teams." So I had told four teams and. The A's were like, uh, we can't draft you anymore. The Pirates said, we can't draft you. Reds were like, we can't have you at our pre-draft workout. The Padres were the only one. And I think Coach Quintero actually helped me get to that workout. They were the only ones who said, we can, you can come to the workout. And even at the workout, I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't hit. I can, I can just run. So I ran like a 6-4, and I tripped. I was like, can I run again? He's like, no, you're good. Like, you ran a 6-4, and that's how I ended up getting drafted. But it's like all those little moments – they were actually pretty big because all that adversity I took, I just try to just keep fighting. And I think, 
even up to this point, you know, in my twenties and my in my thirties, it's like if I could get through my dad's death, then I think I can get through anything. And so I've kind of taken that role. Like whenever something bad happens to me, um, I always take it like if I could get through that, then I can get through anything. So it was almost like it set me up for for the future things in my life where I was like, well, it's actually not that bad. You know, it, it's, it could be worse. It could always be worse. Crazy to think too, that that wasn't even, that was still kind of just the beginning with all the like trials right. and tribulations that you had to find or go through at least. But was the uh, family feud, was that a, uh, was that on the highlight reel that you're sending out to all the coaches? <laughs> Which guys, this dude went viral once and then he ended up going viral again. Thanks to his appearance on the Steve uh, Steve Harvey's Family Feud show, man, that was that was a moment I will never forget. That was so sweet. I used to always watch the Steve Harvey show growing up and everything. Oh my gosh, that was that was a mess for me, but it was good for the family. Like I had some answers on there that were pretty bad. Like, I still get made fun of to this day. I don't know what I was thinking, but Steve Harvey he had us rolling on that. That was a good time. Players weekend, you have to have nasty little bang <laughs> on the back of your jersey when uh if you get to choose one. That's a great idea, actually. We could we could tweet at him and send him a picture. At the very beginning of this, I actually want to introduce you to uh, as that, but I was like, if I start off by saying, Yeah, we got nasty little bang here, <laughs> people probably wouldn't have taken the story as serious as it was at the beginning part. So I'm gonna say it now. Have. I had to wait thirty minutes in to get that out of me. <laughs> That's okay. I'm glad you ate it. <laughs> What's great about that is that is that there's like so many parts of your story that you just seem like they're out of a movie. And when I saw <laughs> when I saw that clip, I had to watch it like five times just to be like, no, nah, that's not him. That's not him. That is him. That is him. Because the hair is different. You know what I mean? Right. The face is different. It seems like if 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 it's in an actual movie, it goes back to like something in the past, like a a, a flashback, and yeah. it's like that character in like CGI form, like his face, everything looks a little bit younger. That's so true, man. I had the Afro that season. Okay. So the, I mean the Afro, it was cause that summer I was doing so well, I was hitting 375. I'm like, I'm not cutting this thing. Like, and then <laughs> I, <laughs> I love Steve Harvey and like on his show and I'll never forget, like people, rappers were talking about it in songs. He had like the perfect lineup. Like, everyone would talk about Steve Harvey's fro, and I was like, we're going to go on Family Feud. I'm going to try to grow out a fro like like Steve did, except I didn't have a lineup, and it wasn't, like, perfect like his. It was just the afro. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and your brother, actually, he must have been a pretty big fan of him, too, because he ended up being on the Steve Harvey show again in 2015. Dude's a two-time Steve Harvey uh, a cameo appearance. I know, right? I was so pumped for him. He actually went on for some type of dating thing, and it came about, I thought it was so cool. I've watched the episode like five different times, but uh, it was it was pretty cool, like how everything got set up so he could reconnect with them. That was, I'm trying to think, so that was, yeah, so 2015, you were on the show. And this whole entire experience, too, happened because it was an email that you sent, wasn't it? Yeah, we, me and my brother. Yeah, guys, Wayne. just send the, if you're thinking about sending a text message or an email <laughs> or making a phone call to something that's going to help you get something that you want or your dreams, just send it right now. Uh, we're actually giving you permission to stop watching this <laughs> or listening to this just to go make that one phone call. Even if it's just to tell somebody that you love them, just go do it right now. Just make it happen. But <laughs> yeah, right. the, uh, that all happened with the email. Yeah, it's like a running joke, even with my mom right now. She always goes, you never know. And because she gets that from me, like I always say, you just never know. So me and Wayne were playing this 1990 video game on the original Nintendo. We could not think of any of the answers. Like we couldn't, we played for like five hours that night. It was like from 12 or 10 o'clock at night to like three in the morning. I was getting so frustrated. I was like, man, let's just go on the real show. He thought I was joking. I sent them an email at three in the morning and I was just telling them about my whole family. We had to play sports. You know, my dad always wanted us to be on the show and you know, my mom was an educator. She would love for us to be on the show, whatever. They emailed us back at like eight in the morning. And they're like, we have auditions in LA if you can make it this weekend. So I was getting all excited. My brother was in law school <laughs> at the time. Walter was like, Walter, can you make it out? He's like, yeah, I can make it out. And then my cousin, Henry, uh, I was like, Henry, you think you can come on? We were trying to get everybody together. And so everybody made it up for the auditions. And I'll never forget, we like killed it on auditions. And the executive producer was like, you guys are going to be on the show. Like, definitely. Just just hang tight. And so then three, three, uh, three months later, 
be showing up in Atlanta and we're on the Steve Harvey or we're on Family Feud. Dude, that's amazing. That is so awesome. And yeah, I can only imagine how much they loved you because your mom seems like such a sweetheart. And then you have three athletes who obviously definitely have some sort of fun personality too, because you guys are <laughs> used to being in locker rooms and clubhouses. So I'm surprised that they haven't asked all of you guys to come back. And you don't even have to answer that question just yet. And I hope I didn't just date this by saying that because who knows, maybe two months from now, you guys might be popping up on the you screen know? for all I know. You never you know. know. You never know. All right. So there's a couple of different instances that I'm going to refer to notes for this. So you're on video for that, right? There's That video is always going to last with uh, the Family Feud and Steve Harvey. And there were a few videos that I had come across on social media that I just thought spoke volumes about who you are as a person and just like your approach with everything. Because it's like you, like we said at the very beginning of this, you played for 17 pro teams, 10 full seasons in the minors, six of them in AAA, five different MLB organizations, playing overseas everywhere, right? There's a lot of people who probably get jaded by that, right? But here you are. One of them that I want to talk about is when Barry Bonds came in 2017. He was with one of the, uh, uh, he was at the ballpark, and you easily could have been saying, like, oh, hey, Barry Bonds is here. That's awesome. There he is. Been shy. Don't want to talk to him. Just want to stay out of his way. But you looked at it as an opportunity. Barry Bonds is here. I get to be around Barry Bonds. Let me try to be a sponge. I have the opportunity, or at least let me position myself to get the opportunity to speak with him. So that video is one of you behind the batting cage with Barry Bonds. So you're trying to learn. You're trying to get better. You're just trying to continue to grow. And that was a cool experience that you got. I thought that was awesome. Another video that I that I wanted to point out too, in Winter League in 2017, you're outside of a stadium and you're playing baseball with a bunch of kids. There's like, it's, it looked like it might've been at the end of the day or after the game maybe, but like you're yeah. playing baseball with a bunch of kids. Like you didn't have to do that, not at all. So there's two instances right there that I'm just like, man, like this dude is like, he's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I think with the first one with Barry Bonds, you know, there's a lot of stigma about, you know, going up to people and approaching people. I'm always just like, well, the worst they could say is no. So I might as well try. If you think they're going to say no, well, how would you know if you don't even try? So I was like, you know what, let me just go pick his brain about anything. And I, I never forget, I asked him. I loved his rhythm. He has that little boom, boom. And I would ask him about his rhythm. Like, how do you feel that? And he was just telling me, like, you know, I kind of do it naturally. But my whole point is to get, you know, a good load. Because the low is sets up everything for your swing. And we're just having, you know, just a normal conversation. So I'm learning from this dude who's a Hall of Famer, or who I think should be a Hall of Famer. And he's telling me all these these good things. And he's just treating me just like I'm a normal person. And so uh, the video with the kid, it was actually in Mexico. And I was just trying to have a good time with him, man. I'm like, some of these kids, they don't have the same exact life that, you know, I've been blessed to have. Um but you could just see their joy and happiness just by someone spending time with them. So I was just like someone that they looked up to. I was like, you know what, let me just take a couple of minutes and, and play around with them. And it's funny because I was having just as much fun as they were. And I remember pitching this ball to this kid. I'm talking this stadium was probably like, it was high, bro. I mean, it was like a hundred, couple hundred, I don't know. It was high. This dude had crushed this pitch. So I was like, <laughs> the video is one thing, but I was genuinely excited. I was like, dang, how did he do that? Like, <laughs> get this kid in the league. And so uh, it was it was fun. Like, you know, my mom liked that video too. She's just like, that just shows kind of the person you are and your, and your character. But it's just me. I just like, you know, I enjoy having a good time and I enjoy having kids or uh, having a good time with kids. Yeah, and who knows, maybe that kid will end up being in the big leagues one day or somebody who is actually <laughs> right. on that side field with you. And 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 uh, one thing that I forgot to point out is that a lot of times in those situations, there's a lot of players who just want to go home. They play the game, they leave, and that's that. But, like, dude, you stuck around, you stayed there, and you're just making people's day left and right. And, yeah, your mom liked that video. One of my personal favorite videos of, of your mom was when she was dancing in the front seat of the car with you uh, when you guys are taking a little road trip i was like let's go <laughs> yeah <I know. laughs> well, she cracked me up man so now check this out you're playing the minors for this entire time right it's like man like there's so many people kind of like what i was just saying before about if you're playing in the winter leagues or overseas or something like that there's some jaded people you just always just kept on going you keep swinging which is exactly why i'm like dude we got to do this this is perfect and 
it, there's a there's a common theme in your threads on all of your social media platforms, which is you take the time to sign autographs for kids. You you take the time to be with people. You take the time to talk to them. You weren't even at the big league level just yet, and you were inspiring kids. Uh, Kelsey Wenger uh, over with the Rockies when she was covering you guys, she had posted a photo soon after your debut at the big league stadium signing autographs for 30 minutes after the game even ended. So while we'll talk about this viral video uh, with your mom that uh, mm -hmm. went everywhere and everybody saw that we played at the beginning of this, I almost think that even if that video wasn't around, you may have been just as big of a headline because each year that you were playing baseball, every single day, every single game that you had, you took the time and you maximized opportunity with fans, speaking to them, encouraging them, that I think that if you just made it to the big leagues and that headline was out, that probably would have gotten thousands and thousands of retweets because of this army that you built day by day in the minor leagues. I really appreciate that. I, I think it's a combination of like a couple of things. Like I said, my parents always said, treat everybody with respect. You know, you got to love everybody. And so if there's a kid who's looking up to me, why would I not go out of my way to try to, you know, help him out? And I'm blessed enough. You know, I learned from, you know, David Justice, Ellis Burks, uh, Phil Plantier, Ken Griffey Jr., like, these guys are the ones who were telling me coming up, like, I, I'm i the role model now, but you got to do this for the next person. So every time I go to the stadium, it's like, I'm a role model for some of these kids so that they can follow their dreams. And it doesn't have to be baseball, but whatever they're trying to do, like, I can set a good example for them. And so just having those interactions, the positive encouragement, that's all something that not only I need, but I feel like everybody needs. And so... To me, that's like, it's actually nothing. Like, staying after the game, after the, after my Major League debut, I was like, I felt totally comfortable. I just asked my family if they can just be patient and wait. But I love that. I love talking to the kids, getting them all excited, because I know how I was as a kid. I saw, I wanted to meet Michael Jordan so bad. I wanted to meet Ken Griffey Jr. so bad. Like, those are my guys, you know? Like, if I ever had the chance to do that, oh, my gosh. I was like, Mom, please sign me up for the North Carolina camp. But she couldn't afford it, you know? So I think – you know, having those positive role models when I was a kid, I know how it feels. So it's like, why not try to do that for the next person? And I hope those kids, they do that for the next person too. So then the cycle can just keep continuing and, you know, we can keep paying it forward. Yeah. And it, one thing that you said about just how you're living your dreams, so you want to help other people live their dreams. That's exactly what Ken Griffey Jr. did with you. So one of these names you had mentioned, next thing you know, I think it was David Justice who had link, linked you guys up, right? Or was it, it was, James Loney? No, it James David Loney. Justice was the FaceTime with Anthony Anderson. James yeah. Loney was the text message with Ken Griffey Jr. And this is like way before any of this stuff that we talked about for the last 20 minutes. So it's <laughs> like you had constant uh, connection with him. But that's just nuts, too, because now you're seeing that if other people are doing it for you, it's like pay it forward. Somebody does something good for you, pay it forward. So Ken Griffey Jr., you get, had that unique opportunity to, to, to have a relationship with him. All right, well, if Ken Griffey Jr. is taking the time for me, why can't I take the time for this kid who's asking me for an autograph or something like this, the hour, hour and 15 minutes to to create some fun content that is going to then hopefully spread like wildfire and more and more people listen to it. Like the, just just the message and everything that you're about is 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 just so awesome. Uh, and that's why a lot of people love you. That's why a lot of people gravitate toward to you. The day that we had met over in Queens, <laughs> I had sent you that DM before because we had followed each other on social media and you didn't even see the DM. This, yeah, this blew my mind. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yo, I'll be out I there. The energy, I'll see you in two seconds. Yeah. Dude, the entire stadium just completely empty. And next thing I know you come out and I'm like, dude, that, this is nuts. Cause as after when I left and I was reading my phone, I was like, damn, you didn't even see that. That's wild. But <laughs> the energy, everything, you're just like a magnet yeah. for, for just positive energy and there's there's something behind that. I don't know what it is, but there's that, something man. behind it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. So big league debut, you get the call, and then you FaceTime your mom, which is the FaceTime that went around the world. Go into that, and how quickly did that news get out? Because we all saw it. Mm-hmm. Well, like, you know, a couple of weeks before that, my agent, you know, he kept texting me. It was John Boggs out in San Diego, and he's just like, man, you just got to keep grinding. Like, you're doing so well. He's giving me the po positive, you know, reinforcement. Like, just keep going. Just keep going. You're right there. You just got to keep pushing, keep pushing away. 
And um, I was thankful for to him for that, especially because there are times I'm like, man, well, you know, what else do I got to do? And he's like, eventually it's going to come. And so I, it kind of took my mind off of it. I could start focusing more on baseball and like exactly what I was doing. Um, I think a lot of the people surrounding me were just like, why hasn't it happened yet? Why hasn't it happened yet? And my agent was able to take me in that position and be like, hey, just focus on what you're doing. And so that really helped me. And it was at a moment where I didn't expect it. When I got called up, we were getting ready for a game, and my manager's like, everybody stand up. And he goes, after, you know, 11 hard minor league seasons, Winston Bernard, going to the big league, boys, and, like, everybody just erupts. You know what I mean? I'm in shock. I'm just like, what is going on right now? Like, I can't even – I couldn't even speak. I wasn't expecting it. And so uh, the first thing, you know, like, you got to call your mom. You got to call your mom. So Brandon Gold and Reagan Todd, two of my boys, were like uh, – they, they were like, we're going to record this. And so I go outside and – pick up the phone you know we're struggling on face i'm like mom can you hear me mom can you hear me you know how people are with their phones like moms don't know how to answer all that she's like i think i got you son i think i got you and so she's kind of messing up at first and I, you know my words was like mom you know i'm going i'm going to the big leagues and just telling her that like oh my gosh there's so much emotion behind it she knows she's she's seen my hard work and dedication every single off season like She's seen everything firsthand. Half the time, she doesn't even know what I'm doing. She just knows I'm, like, out there working hard. Um, but she's, like, seen the type of dedication, all my trials and tribulations growing up from when I was 10 years old. She's seen it all firsthand. And so I think we both just felt that emotion, and it all came full circle. There's been times where, you know, everybody's telling me, like, you should stop playing or you're not good enough to make it, all those types of things. And at that moment, I could tell her I'm going to the big leagues. I think that's what made it so emotional. And that mother-son, that bond is really, really strong between us. And uh, and like I said, I think that's what made it so special. And it makes me proud to know that she was proud. You know what I mean? Because if I didn't make it to the big leagues or not, she's still going to be proud of me, right? But I think she's proud of the fact that I never gave up. And she inspires me because, excuse me, of how hard she's worked her whole life. She never had it easy at any single moment. She was sitting there taking care of my dad. Um, she's providing for, you know, the whole family. And, and she basically took over as mom and dad, you know, after my dad passed away. And so just for her to to have that moment with me was really, really, really special. Oh, for sure. I bet. And, dude, you, went, you go from, like you said, you had zero idea that it was going to happen that day. You're in the locker room or clubhouse and – you're meditating, you're taking your usual nap and super relaxing, super peaceful, quiet. Yeah. Your mom yeah. is at home. She's gardening. And then like <laughs> you guys get this phone call. It's like complete 180. You know, yeah. it's like, it's, it's just, it's just so nuts. And it was such a feel good thing. And it was amazing. And, and, and <laughs> I was watching a documentary the other night about this dude who went viral and then he ended up being like a horrible person, like just absolutely horrible. But like, it's like your story, because <laughs> you never know with these viral moments, like if they're a good person or a jerk, but like your story is just, is just so insane. And you are one of the greatest people, not blowing smoke up your ass, but who you can meet again, like I was saying <laughs> before, you, just the energy around you, just everything that you have, the spirit and something that your mom has said before, which I absolutely love. She said, goodness will prevail when your heart is right. And when you really want something, you will persevere. Mm. I gave me the chills. That's deep, mom. That's deep, mom. Dude, I know. I got them too, man. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Hope <laughs> everybody deep. at home does too. But, but she said that, and and it's exactly what you just said. She knows everything that you've been through. She knows all the all the sacrifices that you had to make, and now you get the call to the big leagues, and it's just a dream, absolute dream come true for you. Then you get to the big leagues, and next thing you know, your coach, Coach McCoy from Niagara. He surprises your mom at the game. She had no idea that he yep. was coming. You had so many other people go to the game. Your brother was able to get off from work from the police department, and your mom showed up. And it's just like you guys are all there together. It's just such an awesome moment. And your first big league hit, I think, sure, I'm sure everybody who gets their big, first big league hit wishes that it was like a home run or a double or something just beautiful. You know what I mean? But, dude, yours was a freaking 
infield. Uh, I was going to say dribbler. I'm not going to say yeah. that. <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're stayed in the infield. There you go. And you hustled it out and the call is overturned and you ended up being safe, which I don't think that could have been any more reflective of your journey, of your path to the big leagues and just shows exactly who you are in that like five second span of time. Just somebody who hustles, somebody who will literally do whatever it takes to get to their goal and believes in themselves. You believed you were safe and you were safe (laughs) and everything turned out just fine. Yeah, that's so true, man. I I never forget hitting that ball and like hustling down the line. Like, Oh gosh, I gotta be, you gotta beat it. Gotta beat it. And they call me out. I'm like, Oh my gosh, come on now. And kind of like you said, this is how my whole life's been. Like, I thought I was safe. You know, I thought I was going to get chance after chance. And it doesn't work that way. And then ultimately, the goodness did prevail, right? Like, I was called safe. Buddy Black, he put on the things, and, and they ended up calling me safe. But, man, that's, that going up to play for that first time, that was amazing. You said Bud Black. That was kind of crazy, too, just the fact that he's the coach and the history right? that you had with him and getting the call while driving and finding everything out. It's like Bud Black was supposed to be your manager for this game. <laughs> exactly he put me in my first spring training game in 2013 and I wasn't necessarily like a huge Padre fan but as I got into college like I remember one scout was like you're kind of like Mike Cameron so I was like oh okay I'm like Mike Cameron like Padres are going to be my team and then Cameron Mabin was there I was like you know these are these are Killer center Cam. fielders who I could look up to yeah I was like oh these are center fielders I could look up to and then Bud Black was the manager at the time I was like oh this would be so cool you know, I got called up with the Padres hometown team and they ended up releasing me in 13. And 10 years later, you know what I'm saying? Like now Bud Black is my manager in the big leagues. Like who would have, who would have even thought? Dude, right? What's also really cool about your big league debut year in 2022 is you even got to rock those cool uh, retro jerseys. This there are the city connects yeah. the, the green Rockies ones, which you made history in those two. And he like stole base and Got a hit. I think you're like the oldest rookie to do that in the same season since some dude in like 1907. <laughs> like, <laughs> like what, dude? Are you kidding, man? You just keep on writing your name in the history books. And it's like what I said before. It's like this is how it was supposed to be. Right. No, for sure. I think a lot of the influence of I had, influences I've had have really, really helped me in life. And I'm blessed to like be able to be surrounded by good people. But not only that, but do my research. I look at like some of the greats right and they're all relentless in what they do you just have to like there's going to be so many obstacles you maybe some more than others but there's always going to be obstacles it's just like how you overcome them and being relentless whatever you do and the perseverance it's just something that i think can truly can truly help you out in life um it just sets you up for good things you know you're going to learn from it and you're you're not ever failing you're just you just keep learning you just keep learning keep learning and so I just try to take that whole philosophy and just run with it. Yeah, you definitely have. And I know you're big into journaling. And uh, I think from your big league debut, I'm sure you probably brought something home or gave something to your mom or just saved anything from that game. So what did you save to kind of remember that? Because I know you could write as many pages in a journal as you want about that special time, but I'm sure it's probably nice to have something up on the wall to remind you of that day. Yeah, so it was cool. The, The bat company sent us a replica bat of my debut i have my bat um it has the the knob sticker and it's a picture of you know me and my me and my dad and then i have one of me and my mom as well um we obviously have the jerseys you know the game tickets we have everything at the house uh we just got to get everything framed up we have some of it framed up like right right in our living room but um just getting everything together and then i have one of my baseball cards which i think is the coolest thing i'm always going to have my own baseball card in the big leagues and Tops made me a card for my debut, and uh, it sold out. So I was trying to, you know, trying to get one. I was asking, does anybody have one? Nobody had one. And one of the fans from Albuquerque were like, hey, I bought three cards on your debut, and I, I got them all, so do you want me to send you one? And so he, oh, he sent wow. me three of them. So I got Dude, some of my own Bernard's baseball Army. cards. <laughs> right? I thought that was, like, the coolest thing in the world. And, uh, you know, I've, I've tried to, like, show some love to, you know, my agent because he's been there since day one. Um, I first had him in 2015, and when I was on the 40 man with the Tigers, he he was the one who kind of stepped in, and he's just been with me along the way. He's seen the journey. He knows the ins and outs of teams saying no to me all the time, and 
he's seen the hard work and dedication. He's always positive. He always, he always says something good's going to happen. And, um, I, I got him like one of my gloves for my debut. And I, I took a picture of everybody from, uh, from the office. Um, uh, Matt Marks, he's, in the, he's one of my other agents. He was like fighting for me the whole time. Such a great dude. And I gave them one of my gifts, like a couple of things for my debut. Um, I'm trying to think. I gave Phil Plantier a jersey, and I said, you know, I couldn't do this without you. He was my hitting coach, you know, for the past 10 years, and he still is. And he's helped me so much, man. If I didn't have him with my swing, I would have been lost. Um, and he took me in when I was first got drafted with uh, the Padres. He was a major league hitting coach, and I was a rookie. Not a first-round rookie. I was a 35th rounder, and he took me into his house. I was like, man, I got to give this guy my jersey because – I wouldn't be where I am if it wasn't for him. So I got two of our baseball cards. I put it on the jersey, signed everything. So I, I you know, I, I was lucky that the Rockies gave me some of my memorabilia back, and I've been able to not keep everything for myself, but I like to give it to other people because they were all a part of the journey. Dude, yeah, everybody gets everybody gets a little bit of a piece of it. And how'd you all celebrate that night? I know uh, I saw one video. Uh, you and your mom were on CBS Colorado, and uh, I know there was a bar back there, but that wasn't that wasn't the night of the of the debut and but i'm sure you guys had somebody in your family had to do some sort of celebrating <laughs> no we definitely did we there's a uh restaurant right behind the stadium at Coors, and so i had all, all my family and friends right there at dinner and it was so cool just having everybody there it's like you know a couple of my brother's best friends growing up they were there my best friends were there um coach mccoy it was it was so cool man just having everybody there and like just enjoying the moment, sucking it all in. Dude, I would have been ripping shots. Just been like, Ooh, that nasty <laughs> little thing. Just being like, let's go. Let's go. I had to play the next day. <laughs> oh, all right. Yeah, that's true. All right. I would have taken them for you then. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. This last hour has been amazing. So thank you so much, man. You're just, your story is so moving. Um, and I, I was checking out uh, your Instagram page and there's a video of you as a kid. And I know you got pictures up there of, of, of you in like a Rockies jersey as a kid and all this other stuff. But there's just one specific video that when I saw it, I could just see the joy in your eye. You were just so happy, just bright, energetic, the same way that you are right now. So when I watch it, I'm thinking, man, like he's always been like this. It's awesome. But when you watch it, I want to know what you think and what you feel, because in my head, I'm also looking at it too. Like, man, this little kid in this video has no idea what the next 30 years of his life are going to look like. Mm. And just if that little kid could know what he would eventually turn into of, of how strong of a person that he was, how brave he was and how much of a family man he was. Man, that's pretty deep. Uh, the video of my dad in the stroller, I hear his voice. I watched that a lot so many times. Just hear my dad's voice, first of all, is what I love. Just the joy in his voice. You know, he, he's, it sounds like he's so proud to have a son. Um, and then me, you just see me look at the camera at my dad or, you know, my mom in the background. I'm just so happy as a kid. And I think that's just from them and the love that they shared. Uh, I, I love watching that for multiple reasons, too. It's like, I think I'm so blessed in life for my parents and I always want to give them credit because they've just done everything. And every single moment I, I had as a kid was special from going to my brother's games to uh, just being in the van with them for 12 hours, driving this place, this place, this place. They always try to make me happy. Heck, my dad got in a car accident because I told him I was hungry. He was speeding on black ice. It's like, the extent that, that they've done for me, I, it's incomparable. Like, I can't even, that's why I'm like, how do I even repay them? You know, um, that, that video just circulates everything. And like, like I said, I think they did such a good job for me um, in my youth that it's, it's just gravitated towards my, my teens and my twenties and my thirties, just because I'm a happy person, but it was all based on my foundation as a kid. So yeah, that, I love watching that video, man. And to hear my dad's voice, I just like, oh, gosh. It brings back a lot of joy. Dude, I love you, man. You are <laughs> just every, like, 
seriously, thank you so much for sharing everything about your story and just kind of going into that video and just, you really are such an inspiration. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, I'm so proud of you. And and, you, and I wish that we had linked up before 2022, but yeah. the fact that we did now and that we're doing this now, I can't wait to continue our relationship. And I'm going to be sending you voice notes uh, throughout the year, left and right, just hyping you up and maybe some <laughs> videos like I did uh, the last couple of weeks. But I want everybody to be able to get a little bit of you as well. So where can everybody follow you on social media? All right, you can follow my social media page. No, uh, <laughs> it's, shoot, I don't even know. I think it's St. Bernie 36 <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> the intro was great. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, I think it's St. Bernie 36 on Twitter and wimpb24 on Instagram. You might have to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I, I really do think those are the two. It's S-A-I-N-T-B-E-R-N-Y 36 on Twitter and then wimpb24 on Instagram. I think that's all I got. Yes, sir. My guy, Winton Bernard, dude, thank you so much for hopping on Keep Swinging. Welcome, you are the man, man and definitely big things ahead for you, brother. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, man. This has been great. And you've really done all your research. Like it, it, it helps me, you know, talking about everything, but it excites me too, because I know a lot of people are going to be inspired by it. But um, you're a great dude, man. I really appreciate it. Like this was, this was awesome. This was one of my, my best ones. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs>